Hello everybody, my name is Ray. Welcome to the Evangelical Dark Web. Today we will be talking about Ravi Zacharias and we will also be providing a little inside baseball about how I go about writing about false teachers and potential false teachers. So Ravi Zacharias will be uh, the subject for today and he's come under a lot of scrutiny lately and rightfully so, I'm going to add. And I got to say, I'm not really emotionally impacted by this, but I understand those of you who are. I know what this situation is like, and that's really the reason why I want to make this video talking about Ravi Zacharias is because I know what it's like to have a Christian leader that you look up to uh, turn out to be a moral failure and or deconstruct their own faith. So this is important to me, not because Robbie Zacharias, but because, you know, the man who baptized me and half my family would later on go on to have an adulterous affair with another staff member of the church. And he, at the time, he was also one of the pastors that I was closest to and my family was closest to. So for him to deconstruct and fall into sin and the last update we have from that situation is his refusal to really just come back from that and that kind of leads us into the theological discussion regarding this these circumstances so there are three schools of thought with this where someone who kind of falls away from the Christian faith. You know, the first is the uh, Calvinist reform position that is perseverance of the saints, where someone who is regenerate will continue to live a Christian life. They will continue to go along the sanctification journey. They will not deconstruct or... Um, renounce their faith. The uh, second position is the Arminian position, which believes that you can lose your salvation if you deconstruct your faith or, you know, fall into apostasy. These, uh, the Calvinist and the Arminian position actually are describing the same exact circumstances. They have a dif different method of explaining how it works, but they're describing the same events. And then you have this kind of wish-washy position called eternal security, which is kind of a once saved, always saved. And a lot of churches that teach this, I, I, I kind of grew up with this in like Sunday school settings, but a lot of churches that teach this are really watering down the perseverance of the saints doctrine. And I don't believe it's biblical at all. And so basically what we're dealing with with Ravi Zacharias is, is he's someone that finished the race of living a Christian life. And I got to tell you, it looks like with all of these scandals that he had, he was an unregenerate person. So that's what it looks like. My personal opinion is that Ravi Zacharias was indeed a false teacher. And I'll explain more of this later on in the video, but that's my personal prediction. But I get asked all the time to write about various false teachers, and eventually I do. You know, it's kind of a research project that I undertake. And I've been asked multiple times to write about Ravi Zacharias. And this was before all these sex scandals came out. I, and I guess some people requested it afterwards. But And the reason why I didn't really want to do this is because he was dead. And I feel as though writing about a living teacher is more fruitful than writing about someone who's died. However, I like I said in the beginning, this issue of fallen heroes is important to me. And I want to use this as an opportunity to instruct 
believers in doctrine, specifically that the Christian life is a race, and it's a race you must finish. Both the Calvinists and Arminians agree on this principle. They disagree with how it works, but they agree that someone who is someone who professes to believe in Christ at one point in their life must continue that faith journey. And I want to use this to kind of motivate you in your Christian faith walk to continue your journey. So, now that we've gotten my personal uh, opinion on Ravi Zacharias, let's kind of dive into why someone would think that he was a false teacher before these scandals kind of came up. And I have, there's kind of four reasons why. One of them's a sex scandal related, but I'll get to that later. And the first red flag that I see is that Ravi Zacharias uh, interacted with the Mormon church. And that's a pagan church. And I don't see why a, a Christian apologist who specializes in arguing against atheism, arguing that atheism is a logically untenable position, is lending his resources to a pagan church that is already... Uh, theistic. I don't see the reason why uh, Ravi Zacharias needs to help a pagan church. So I have an issue with that. And the second red flag, and I labeled the uh, Mormon thing under ecumenicalism, but, you know, a lot of times evangelicals debate, you know, where Catholics are, you know, is it acceptable to, uh, you know, preach the gospel with Catholics? And I understand that debate, but I don't think there's any room for debate on the Mormon church whatsoever. So, and then the second issue was uh, homosexuality. And it's, and this has less to do with what Ravi Zacharias has preached or said, but more to do with who he has platformed. And one of the teachers that he has platformed is Sam Albury. Sam Albury is the founder of Living Out, a ministry that popularizes the term same-sex attraction as distinct from homosexuality. Uh, Living Out supports people to identify themselves as gay or same-sex attracted Christians, as opposed to Christians who were formerly homosexual. And Tom Buck of Apologia Ministries, I believe, uh, wrote this about living out. Essentially, living out teaches that a same-sex attracted individual is fixed in his orientation and the orientation itself does not need to be mortified. While they admit that acting on the desire would be sin, and the attraction itself is the result of the fall, a church is not biblically inclusive if they tell a Christian who experiences same-sex attraction that they need, or that they should should even seek for God to remove that desire. They go so far as to say, attempting to change someone's sexual orientation sends a number of potentially dangerous potentially damaging messages, our sexual orientation is not a sign that we need counseling more than anyone else. While I agree scripture nowhere promises that Christians will be free from all struggles of sin, it is crystal clear how we should confront our sinful desires. And uh, Tom Buck concludes with Colossians 3.5. And I think it's a red flag that... Ravi Zacharias platformed Sam Albury while he was undermining the Bible's teaching on sexuality, specifically homosexuality. Again, these are two red flags that I have pointed out with regards to Ravi Zacharias. I do not think that these two red flags alone are enough to prove that he is a false teacher, but the red flags are starting to pile up. And I want to talk about one more uh, thing, and I didn't write about this 
in my own article on Ravi Zacharias, which I will link in the description below. And that is that Ravi Zacharias has apparently had a history of lying about his resume. And there's this atheist who runs a website called Ravi Watch who documents this. And I think that guy's a little obsessed with Ravi Zacharias, but he definitely points out a lot of useful things, such as instances where Ravi Zacharias made up entire academic departments at universities to puff up his resume. And I think that's pretty unethical, and it's very self-serving. It's, it's, again, a red flag. So now we move on to the sex scandals. So the earliest sex scandal that we knew about was in was uh, occurred in late 2007, early 2018, that time frame, and with a woman named Lori Ann Thompson. And she's a shady character, and that needs to be made clear. She's a shady character. It does come across as she's trying to use the Me Too movement to kind of go after Ravi Zacharias. It does come off as that type of situation. And in the end, I don't know how to, I can't uh, take a, you know, Occam's razor and determine definitively what goes on or what happened in this situation, but I have an estimate. But let's just read, uh, this was uh, the Christian Post on the situation in 2017 when the allegations first surfaced. The apologist released a statement saying that he did not elicit any photos or messages and clearly instructed her to stop contacting me in any form. I'll block her messages. He maintained that he never engaged in any inappropriate behavior of any kind during his marriage with his wife or to his wife, Margie. In Zacharias' lawsuit against the Thompsons, he claimed that Lorianne had coaxed him into an illicit online affair and that the Canadian couple was attempting to extort money. So despite the fact that Ravi Zacharias first started out claiming that these uh, accusations were baseless, he would really get the legal hounds uh, involved in this, and I think he would have actually go on to uh, file a RICO lawsuit against the Thompsons. And he has a lot more resources than the Thompsons. He can... You know, he has a deeper war chest to fund lawyers against the Thompsons. However, you know, there's a settlement. So, and then we also got to look out. Ravi Zacharias is on the record in text messages threatening suicide in order to prevent Thompson from confessing their involvement in a sexting affair to her husband. These are text messages that showed that showed what Ravi Zacharias was doing with this situation. You know, ultimately, the changing defense of Ravi Zacharias is troubling, but Lorianne Thompson appears in no way to be as a victim, as she is a willing participant in all that went on. So, like I said, it's hard to estimate what went on in this situation, but here is my official estimation is that Ravi Zacharias was lured into a honeypot scheme. And if you recall, the honeypot is what um, the uh, Robert Jeffress Jr. of uh, Liberty University, you know, his pool boy was having an affair with a wife and they got lured into some sort of honeypot thing, blackmail scheme with that guy. It's kind of the same thing. And the point of emphasis I want to make is that innocent people do not end up in honeypot situations. The point of a honeypot is that they use one misdeed to get you to continue committing misdeeds and that you are further along into the honeypot. That's the point of a honeypot. You know, it's kind of like that episode of Black Mirror, Shut Up and Dance, where, you know, they get you on a blackmail, and then get you to commit all of these felonies following the blackmail that they have on you. And you're just deeper and deeper into this hole. 
So that's the honeypot, and I believe Rock, Ravi Zacharias was involved in some sort of low-level honeypot scheme. So now we get to the more recent allegations. And the more recent allegations against Ravi Zacharias involve grooming masseuses that worked for establishments that he owned. And I gotta say, he's dead. Ravi Zacharias is dead. He does not get a trial. The tr trials are for the living. You know, he is a historical figure, so we will debate this evidence as though he is a historical figure, not a living person on trial. Therefore, it is not necessary for Ravi Zacharias to be able to face his accusers for us to examine or believe this evidence. So, there's a lot of questions that get raised in this situation. First, why does Ravi Zacharias, an international apologist, have massage parlors? Why does he co-own or own entirely massage parlors? Stereotypically speaking, massage parlors are often underground brothels. That's a stereotype, not true in every instance, of course, but if you look at you know famous celebrities like Robert Kraft, owner of the New England Patriots, who went to, I believe it was Miami, it was Florida, and he got caught, he got busted in a sting at a massage parlor for trying to solicit prostitution. That's the type of activity that I'm talking about, and it seems very unwise for a Christian apologist to own massage parlors because it gives off the appearance of something that could go wrong. And that's kind of like the Billy Graham rule, right? Billy Graham realized, you know, let me set up barriers for myself so that I do not fall into uh, temptation. And it seems like Ravi Zacharias just blew past what would have been a wise barrier, such as not owning massage parlors. That just seems kind of shady. So, you know, at first, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, RZIM, denied these accusations until they started to investigate them for themselves. Um, RZIM has every incentive to deny the allegations in order to keep the money flowing. So they have every incentive to deny the accusations, but they ultimately concede to the accusations upon the interim findings which came out right before Christmas of 2020. This would indicate that the interim findings are in, you know, indisputable. So let's just read what the interim report reads. I'm going to start, I believe, from the second paragraph. As you know, my firm was hired by Ravi Zacharias International Ministries to conduct an independent investigation into allegations of sexual harassment raised against Ravi Zacharias. This communication is intended to provide this special committee of the RZIM board of directors with a very high level interim update into the investigation so far. As to the methodology, we have contract we have contracted with a well regulated, well regarded private investigation firm to assist us in this matter. Over the past several weeks, our investigation team has interviewed dozens of witnesses whose identities will remain known only to Miller to the Miller and Miller investigation team, as well as the as agreed to by the RZIM board of directors, including many massage therapists who treated Mr. Zacharias. Some of the therapists with whom we spoke worked with worked at the Touch of Eden and Jivian Wellness Spas mentioned in the September 29th, 2020 Christianity Today article, and others provided treatments to Mr. Zacharias at different points in time. In addition to witness interviews, we 
have re reviewed numerous documents and electronic devices used by Mr. Zacharias over the years. As to the scope, we, hi we were hired specifically to investigate sexual harassment alleged to have occurred at the Touch of Eden and Jivian Wellness Spas roughly a decade ago. However, we were given... Uh, we were given broad discretion and authority to follow leads into other sexual misconduct that might arise. And we, and that is exactly what we have done at, the, at this time. We are not disclosing any specific conduct. We are investigating beyond the spa allegations, but the full breadth of our investigation will be addressed in our final report. While the while some of the massage therapists we have tried to interview are not willing to share their experience with us. Many have spoken candidly and with great detail. Combining those interviews with our review of documents and electronic data, we have found significant, credible evidence that Mr. Zacharias engaged in sexual misconduct over the course of many years. Some of that misconduct is consistent with and corroborate corrob corroborative of that which is reported in the news recently and some of the con conduct we have uncovered is more serious our investigation is ongoing and we continue to pursue leads that's the excerpt that i pulled in my own article on robbie zacharias from the um, interim report and the interim report is damning evidence is how i think about it um, it appears that the private investigation into Ravi Zacharias, you know, initially focused on the spas and the massage parlors. And it appears that they released this interim report because they are pursuing additional leads and they have broadened the scope of their investigation, but they're providing an interim report of their findings for the initial uh, scope of their investigation, and that is Robbie Zacharias uh, treating his employees like prostitutes. So, you know, like I said, why did he own massage uh, multiple spas in the first place? That seems like an odd addition to his portfolio. And... That's what it comes across as he was trying to make prostitutes out of his employees. So that's what Ravi Zacharias is accused of doing, and that's really bad. And I don't know if this is true or not. However, it is worth speculating whether he used um, like the immigration system regarding uh, you know H-1-2B visas, I think they're called. But... A lot of hospital hotels and cruise ships use a certain visa program, which gives a lot of leverage to the employer. And I don't know whether Rafi Zacharias abused that um, visa program, the immigration status of his employees. That's possible. I'm just throwing that out there as a possibility of what else he may have done. But it seems like he was an abusive employer trying to prostitute his employees. And that's wrong, that's sinful, and that's unbecoming of a Christian minister. This behavior would indicate a lack of regeneration in a person's soul. This is not a David and Bathsheba slip-up. And that wasn't really a slip-up. I mean, it started out with David's laziness, and, you know, he's, on the, he's not going out to battle with his troops, he watches uh, Bathsheba, he summons her, and has an affair with her, an adulterous affair, and ends up murdering Uriah. We see that. But this is far more, um, I, I think the comparison is not David and Bathsheba, but the contrast, rather, is David and Abishag. If you uh, open up your Bibles to First Kings, you see the story of David and Abishag. And David is really old, really old, and he cannot keep warm, no matter how many blankets they throw on him. So, they, so his advisors give him this beautiful young virgin nurt, 
to be his nurse or and bed warmer. You know, their intent is to basically, you know, get David in a compromising situation. But the Bible makes clear that David did not um, have sexual relations with Abishag. The Bible makes that clear. So I think that is the comparison with King David we should be making with Ravi Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias is similar, was similarly up there in years. So that's the comparison I believe is more legitimate. So I don't, the last thing is I do not know what these other allegations could have been. Maybe these were rape allegations. I don't know. And I'm not going to presuppose to know because, as the interim report suggested, these were outside of the scope of the initial investigation. So, like I said, the debate is whether Ravi Zacharias was ever saved. And Ravi Zacharias was an intellectual, and I would fall under this category as well. And with intellectuals, people who are more logically minded. The, um, it is, you are more susceptible as a more logically minded person to accept uh, Christianity on an intellectual level. You accept in Christianity as true intellectually, but you do not have that internalized relationship with Jesus. You do not have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you, even though you understand Christian doctrine, you even acknowledge Christian doctrine. But, you know, Christianity is not about, you know, just accepting uh, historical facts. It's about accepting Jesus into your heart. So that is the struggle that, you know, more logically minded people, people have, and I would presuppose that Ravi Zacharias would fall into this category. The opposite would be, you know, someone who doesn't really know the Jesus that they have accepted into their heart. You know, the, a more emotionally minded person would fall, would be more susceptible to this. So we really have to know Jesus. And you know, Ravi Zacharias, you know, toward the world, debating atheism. He proclaimed theism. However, he might not have internally accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit in his life. And I think that's very possible. There's a lot to say in scripture about this type of thing. Uh, Deuteronomy 13 articulates how God allows false teachers to prosper in order to test the discernment of his people. And we also have, you know, Jesus, you know, saying to those, depart from me, I never knew you. So that is a very possible situation with Ravi Zacharias. That, you know, on the day of judgment, he will say, look, Lord, you know, Lord, Lord, I did all these things in your name. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's a very possible situation. And I just want to kind of like compare this to like, you know, uh, and the comparison I make with this is Ben Shapiro, who's not a Christian, obviously. Uh, he's Jewish, but, you know, he doesn't actually believe in the miracles of the Old Testament. And he said this on a podcast with Joe Rogan. He kind of articulate that, you know, we're not really a people that believe in miracles. And would, you know, explain a strong east wind as this, you know, what really made the uh, parting of the Red Sea happen as opposed to, you know, God's direct intervention. That type of thing, which, you know, again, that's like theological liberalism. But, you know, he's the type of person that is theologically liberal but still upholds the traditions. And I think that's kind of where Ravi Zacharias kind of falls on this. You know, he intellectually acknowledged 
God acknowledged the usefulness, the utility of theism, but ultimately was probably not someone who believed. I th That's my opinion on who Ravi Zacharias is on a teacher, or who he is as a teacher. Now, I have like a rating system, and a category three is not a false teacher. As you see, my verdict is it is very possible that Ravi Zacharias did not finish the race, meaning it's very possible that he was a false teacher all along, that he was unregenerate, but like I said, very articulate at um, arguing the utility of theism. However, because we do not have the um, the full report of all his potential misdeeds, I hesitate to say that he was a false teacher in my own writing. Like personally, I think it is true. That's my prediction if I were to put money on this. But I cannot prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And the reasonable doubt is that we have not seen, we have not received the full report of all the evidence. And that report is coming hopefully soon. But that is my hesitation with declaring that Ravi Zacharias is a false teacher. So, you know, this is the evangelical dark web. This is a little bit of a longer form than what I usually do on my videos. But it's necessary to explore the topic of Ravi Zacharias. I know a lot of people were deeply saddened when these allegations were revealed. And more so when these allegations were conceded by RZIM. So, you know, I'm here for you. I want to help you um, go through this because I've been through this before. And I also want to use this, you know, like I said, to glorify God and to use this to, as a lesson to motivate you in your own faith journey. So at Evangelical Dark Web, you know, we write about false teachers or potential false teachers. Not everyone that I've ever written about is a false teacher. If I can't prove that they are, I'll say that I cannot prove that they are. And with Ravi Zacharias, I have one last strain of reasonable doubt that he's not. And... That is that these reports have not come out yet. So if you want to request someone for me to write about, I will put that link in the description below. If you want to see the answered request that I have written, I will also link that in the description below. Uh, Evangelical Dark Web is a discernment ministry that specializes in combating three specific false gospels, the social justice gospel, the prosperity gospel, and the popularity gospel. And that is what we do. And in that, we write about false teachers. And a lot of people ask me to write about Ravi Zacharias. I said no until this type of situation came up, and I kind of felt compelled to. Because usually I go and I select the person with the most uh, requests. But that wasn't really the case with the Robbie Zacharias. I really felt strongly about talking about this subject. So, my name is Ray. This is the Evangelical Dark Web. If you like this content, do subscribe. And I also ask that you uh, share this video because YouTube algorithms will not help an independent Christian content creator like myself get ahead of these algorithms, it does require audience engagement, and I'd like to see more people get a biblical message on YouTube. So leave a comment below about what you think about what I think, and I will catch you on the next one.